Well, welcome to River Church Online. I'm so glad that you're engaging with us in this way. If I haven't yet met you, my name is Ashley, and we're in the third week of our series called Joseph from Pit to Palace. And if you've been with us, you've noticed that Joseph spends a lot of time in the pit. He just seems to move from one pit to another to another. He experiences major family drama. He had serious trouble with an employer. He was stabbed in the back. And Joseph's story is so relevant and relatable because these are all things that we experience in life. And maybe something has resonated with you in this series because you've been able to recognize, hey, I'm in a pit. And as we learned in week one, we need to admit we're in a pit when we're in a pit. Maybe your pit is circumstantial or emotional, or maybe it's physical or financial or relational or even spiritual. Whatever it is, wherever you're at, I believe God wants to speak to you today. And my prayer is that you would find wisdom, encouragement, and hope from the story of Joseph. Now, just to remind you where Joseph has come from, he was the 11th of 12 sons, and he was his father's favorite. It was clear to everyone in the family that his dad loved him more than any, anyone else. Joseph had special treatment, special privileges. Like if there was a concert, he'd have the VIP backstage pass. His dad gave him special gifts, and God gave him special dreams. And these dreams seemed to indicate that all of his brothers would bow down in submission to him. Now, I don't know how you'd respond, but this caused his brothers to hate him. And so one day they attacked him, they threw him into a pit, and then sold him into slavery. It was the worst day of his life. He went from being the favorite son to a slave in Egypt. But Joseph's story didn't end there. The Bible says the Lord was with Joseph. Joseph worked hard, he trusted God, and God blessed him. Joseph ended up in charge of his master's entire household. He was still a slave, but he was now on a position of influence and was seemingly climbing out of the pit. Joseph was honoring God, serving his employer, doing everything right, and then one day he stabbed in the back. His master's wife falsely accused him, and Joseph was thrown into prison. So now he's in a deeper pit than ever before, and today we're going to read that Joseph was forgotten. Let me ask you, have you ever felt forgotten? It's a terrible feeling. It's kind of like playing dodgeball. Everyone that has that fear of being picked last. Like, no one wants you to be on their team, right? But being forgotten is worse. It would be like the captains choosing their teams and everyone's name is called Except Yours. And then the game starts and everyone's having a grand old time and no one even notices you're still on the sidelines. And personally, I've wrestled with this feeling. And let me tell you, forgotten is painful. When my husband Jeremiah and I started having babies, We wanted our babies to have siblings, so we decided to have as many as we could as fast as we could. And this landed me four children within five years. Yeah. And in those foggy days of 542 and new, forgotten came over for coffee quite a bit. It lingered over my kitchen sink, and it stared at me from my bathroom mirror. Now, trying to be a good mommy and advocating naps Meals and bedtimes meant that I bowed out of of a lot of fun. And the more I mothered, the more I felt forgotten. And for a while, I partnered with these lies. Everybody else gets to stay late and go out to eat and go to the conferences and do all the fun stuff. But no one even asks me. I'm just over here on the sidelines watching everyone else play the game. And you don't have to be a mother to relate to this pain of forgotten. Maybe you've just moved to town or you've returned to college and it feels like your support system is gone. Maybe your career was taking off, but now your work isn't getting noticed and you keep getting passed up with every promotion. Maybe you've just gone through a tough breakup or a divorce and it feels like no one is there for you and you're all alone. 
I don't know what your situation is today, but that's how Joseph felt. His brothers got rid of him. His father thinks he's dead. The people he trusted betrayed him. And he's sitting in prison for something he didn't do. He was alone and everyone else had moved on. And this is where we pick up Joseph's story. Turn with me to Genesis 39. So he, this is Joseph's master in verse 20, took Joseph and threw him into the prison where the king's prisoners were held and there he remained. And if you were here with us last week, the next few verses will sound familiar. It says in verse 21, but the Lord was with Joseph in the prison and showed him his faithful love. And the Lord made Joseph a favorite with the prison warden. Before long, the warden put Joseph in charge of all the other prisoners and over everything that happened in the prison. The warden had no more worries because Joseph took care of everything. The Lord was with him and caused everything he did to succeed. Sound familiar? That's exactly what happened when Joseph was a slave. Bad stuff happened. Joseph trusted God and God blessed Joseph. Joseph is now in charge yet again And that's how he meets two new characters in the story. In Genesis 40, we read, Sometime later, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their master, the king. Pharaoh was angry with his two officials and put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the same prison where Joseph was confined. In verse 4, the captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph and he attended them. After they had been in custody for some time, each of the two men, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were being held in prison, had a dream the same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. Now, Joseph's built some relationship with these guys, so they decide to share their dreams with him. And in verse 9, the chief cupbearer told Joseph his dream. He said to them, in my dream, I saw a vine in front of me and... On the vine were three branches. As soon as it budded, it blossomed, and its clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes, squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup, and put the cup in his hand. This is what it means, Joseph said. The three branches are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your position. And you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand just as you used to do when you were his cupbearer. Now, if you were the cupbearer, I'm sure you'd be excited to hear, hey, in three days, you'll be back in the palace, baby. So Joseph gives the meaning of the dream, and then he asks for his favor. He says in verse 14, but when all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews, and even here I have done nothing to deserve being put in a dungeon. Look, I've been forgotten, so please, please remember me. Well, it turned out just like Joseph said it would, but look what happens in verse 23. The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. Wow. Just like that, Joseph's hopes for getting out of prison crumbled. Joseph took care of this guy. He was there for him. I mean, all he had to do was mention Joseph's name. Was that too much to ask? Well, apparently so, because the cupbearer went back to his own life and didn't even think about Joseph for another two years. It had to have been tough for Joseph, and it's certainly tough for you and I when we're forgotten. So what do you do when you're forgotten? Well, today I'm going to give you four things. The first is this. You need to cancel the pity party. Listen, pity likes its party, and it loves to have you as the guest of honor. I'm sure you've heard the song, it's my party, gonna cry if I want to, right? It's gonna be stuck in your head for the rest of the day. Hey, you would cry too if it happened to you. And when you're forgotten, you'll be tempted to throw yourself a pity party. You might start asking yourself these questions. Why did this happen to me? 
What did I do wrong? Why do they always get to do the fun stuff? And when you're in that headspace, you start to feel sorry for yourself. And pretty, pretty soon, you're throwing yourself a full-blown pity party complete with cake, balloons, and a tub of ice cream. You need to cancel the pity party. Like, call up the bakery and say, never mind on the cake. And I want to point out to you a little phrase hidden in Joseph's story that reveals that Joseph canceled his. Remember, Joseph was put in charge of the prison, and we see this. In Genesis 39, verse 23, the warden had no more worries because Joseph took care of everything. The Lord was with him and caused everything he did to succeed. Joseph took care of everything. Now, does that sound like someone who's throwing themselves a pity party? No, I don't think so. Joseph might have had a rough start. Maybe he did feel sorry for himself at first. And he could have stayed there in that place of self-pity, but he didn't. Eventually, he picked himself up, dusted himself off, and he got back to work. And God blessed it. And listen, it's okay to be upset when you feel forgotten. But don't wallow in self-pity because that's when you start to push God out. Instead, David says, he says in Psalm 55, 22, Give your burdens to the Lord and he will take care of you. He'll sustain you. He'll lead you out. He will not permit the godly to slip and fall. Instead of feeling sorry for yourself, give your burdens to God. Do your part and trust God to do his. And this brings us to the second thing you need to do when you're forgotten. Trust that God is working. Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that in all things, God works. God is working. God works for the good of those who have been called according to his purpose. And when you trust that God is working, even in your pit, even when you're forgotten, suddenly you have a different perspective. And perspective is powerful. Perspective gives you a better vantage point and a clear outlook. And it's so important for us to have. Joseph had an eternal perspective. He trusted that God was working. He kept his heart right. And when we have an eternal perspective, all the stuff that we stress about and lose sleep over, it seems to fade away in the light of eternity. And we're able to endure and persevere with this posture of trust, a trust that God is working. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that Joseph didn't wrestle with doubt. I mean, just think about his story so far. He's been threatened with his life, thrown into a pit, sold into slavery, falsely accused, given a life sentence in prison, and then forgotten. It's safe to say that Joseph probably felt abandoned, and he might have even felt abandoned by God. And I'm sure it was easy for Joseph to see God's hand of favor on him when he was his father's favorite and parading around in his special coat. But what about when he was in the pit or in the prison? It's easy to see God in the good times, but it's sometimes harder to see him when, when we're struggling or in pain or we feel like we've been forgotten. When life treats you unfairly or people stab you in the back or you feel abandoned, you may find yourself asking, where is God now? Well, do you want to know where he is? We just read it. Let's read it again. In Genesis 39, verse 21, but the Lord was with Joseph in the prison and showed him his faithful love. Man, I love that. And the Lord made Joseph a favorite with the prison warden. So where is God when you are mistreated, overlooked, or forgotten? He's with you. And you can trust that he's working. Philippians 1, 6 says, and I am certain that God who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. Can you say this? Are you certain that God is working? Are you trusting God in your pit? Or do you feel alone, like you've been completely abandoned and forgotten? The truth is that God is with you. 
God is working and you can trust him. Hebrews 10, 23 says, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm for God can be trusted to keep his promise. The next thing you need to do when you're forgotten is choose to serve others. Choose to serve others. Because we're, when we're in the pit, when we're going through a tough time, stabbed in the back, betrayed, feeling forgotten, it's so tempting to focus on ourselves. In fact, the world would want you to, to concentrate on your own comfort, to do the things that are self-seeking and self-satisfying. It's time for me to focus on me. But that's exactly the kind of thinking that gets you into a deeper pit. It keeps you from... from Uh, feeling sorry for yourself. It keeps you plotting revenge. It keeps you from trusting or forgiving people. It makes you bitter and not better, and it slowly poisons you. But choosing to serve others is God's antidote. Philippians 2.3 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. And I think this is exactly how Joseph positioned himself for promotion in prison. He chose to serve others. Let's get back to our story. If you remember, the king, he became upset with his cupbearer and baker, and he threw them into prison. In Genesis 40, verse 4, they remained in prison for quite some time, and the captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph, who looked after them. Now, Joseph is locked in prison, but he's not moping around in his cell. He's choosing to serve others. He's looking after these guys. And in verse 6, Joseph came into them in the morning and looked at them and saw that they were sad. Now, I've never been to prison before. Uh, That would be a scandal, right? Pastor's life, a prison sentence. But my only reference is, is really what's portrayed in the movies. And I... Don't picture it to be a super joyous place, right? A little depressive. And I can't imagine that there's a lot of people that stop to notice when you're sad and ask, oh, what's wrong? Are you having a bad day? Do do you want to talk about it? But that's exactly what Joseph did. He wasn't focused on himself. He noticed they were upset and he asked them in verse 6, he says, hey, why do you look so sad today? I I love that. Joseph didn't make the pit make him bitter and self-centered. He didn't let the pit harden his heart. Instead, he chose to serve others in the pit. I love that Proverbs 11.25 says, whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Listen, God is going to bless the people who choose to serve others. So what do you do when you're forgotten? Cancel the pity party. Trust that God is working, choose to serve others, and number four, see and seize God-given opportunities. God placed two people from the king's house in Joseph's care. And because Joseph wasn't blinded by self-pity and had an eternal perspective, he was able to not only see, but seize the opportunities that God had given him. And when you're, you're in the pit, God will bring opportunities your way, very often in the form of people to love. But if your attention is in the wrong place, it's easy to miss. Just because God gives us opportunities doesn't mean that we recognize them every time. Sometimes we're too discouraged or too busy feeling sorry for ourselves or we're focusing on our problems rather than the fact that God is working but not so with Joseph. Remember, he noticed these two men were sad, so he asked, why? And in verse 8, it says, And they replied, We both had dreams last night, but no one can tell us what they mean. Interpreting dreams is God's business, Joseph replied. Go ahead and tell me your dreams. Now, did Joseph know that this was going to be the key that unlocked the prison door? I can't say that for sure, but what I can say is that Joseph had eyes to see and seize God-given opportunities. He simply saw a need, and he decided to fill it. And sometimes we miss God's opportunities because we're too busy looking for something big and flashy. But all too often, God's opportunities come in small, 
selfless packages and we seize them with simple acts of obedience. So we've got to open our eyes and say yes to an act of kindness or generosity, a small favor, listening when someone needs to talk, calling when the Lord puts someone on your heart, praying when you feel burden to pray. And church, if you will cancel the pity party, trust that God is working, choose to serve others and see and seize God-given opportunities, God will lift you out of the pit. That's exactly what we see happen with Joseph. Now, it didn't happen right away. Remember, the text says Joseph was forgotten for two more years. Two more years. That's plenty of time to get bitter. That's plenty of time to get cynical, to be angry at God, to give up. But not Joseph. He trusted that God was working. And then the story shifts yet again. Two full years had passed and Joseph interpreted the cupbearer's dream when Pharaoh had two dreams of his own. Now you can read it later on, but these dreams were troubling to Pharaoh. So he sent for all the magicians and wise men of Egypt. He needed some help, but no one could help him. No one could interpret the dreams for him. And then the cupbearer remembered how he had spent some time in prison with a guy named Joseph and how Joseph had been able to interpret his dream. Hey, maybe he can interpret your dream, Pharaoh. So we read in verse 14. Let me find it here. So Pharaoh sent for Joseph and he was quickly brought from the dungeon. When he had shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream and no one can interpret it. But I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. This is it. This is Joseph's shot to get out of of the pit forever. All he's got to do is show how amazing he is, how valuable he is, how confident and smart he is. But take notice how he responds. Verse 16, I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh. Like, I'm not the one that can help. But God will give the Pharaoh the answers he desires. He puts the attention and the focus on God. Hey, you don't need me. You need him. And Joseph trusted God in the depths of the pit. And he's not about to stop trusting him now that he's in the palace. Joseph knew that the Lord was with him. So he goes ahead and he interprets Pharaoh's dream. Essentially, there were going to be seven years of abundance followed by seven years of terrible global famine. And not only did God allow Joseph to interpret the dreams, but he gave him the wisdom to roll out a plan to save Egypt. And Pharaoh, he's blown away. He says, that's it. In verse 39, the Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace, and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. And as I close, aren't you glad that Joseph's story didn't end while he was forgotten? That we don't read, and he wasted away in the dungeon, the end. I'm so thankful that even when Joseph was forgotten by men, he wasn't forgotten by God. Joseph's story is that God took him from the pit to the palace, from prisoner in the dungeon to prince of Egypt. God never stopped working in his story. And you need to know that God hasn't stopped working in yours. Like, have you ever had a conversation with your best friend over text messaging? You'll notice that sometimes when you're waiting for a response, there are three dots that pop up and they kind of dance and move. You all know what what I'm talking about, right? It means the other person is typing. And when it comes to your story, the author of life is typing. He's writing your story. He's working on it, in it, and through it. And maybe you've been waiting for the response, but know that he's working 
This should build some form of excitement and expectancy and anticipation. This should swell up big faith and bold prayers from inside of you to know that God isn't done with you, that he's working in your life and on your behalf, that you aren't forgotten, that you can trust him to take you from the pit and place you in the palace. Let's go ahead and pray. Wherever you're at right now, I just want to welcome you to closing your eyes and posturing your heart to receive from the Lord. I know that this, this message is timely for many of you, that you are in a pit of, of feeling forgotten. And I pray that as we've talked through the, this story, that something's welled up on the inside of you, that you're saying, hey, Ashley, I, I want to believe it. Help, help me, God, to believe that you're with me, that you're working. And if that's you, I just want you to say, hey, that's me. Ashley, that is me, and I'm there, and I'm going to pray for you right now. God, I just thank you for everyone that's responding, God, to this message, to this truth that says that you will never leave us. You will never forsake us. You will never forget about us. God, and I just pray for a comfort that only you can. God, when friends have stabbed us in the back, when people have walked away from us, God, when people have, have said ill things and falsely accused, God, I just ask you, God, for your, for your heart of compassion and forgiveness, God, of grace on all of my friends. God, they would see that you are working in their life, God, on their story. God, and I just ask you in the name of Jesus that you would give them a fresh wind of hope, God of expectancy, God of, of, of prayer and belief, God of faith that you will be faithful to complete the work that you began. God, and I just pray for, for that as, as we leave. And as we keep praying, perhaps you're, you're resonating, something's resonating with you and you feel like you're in the pit, but you do feel alone. You do not feel that God is with you. And if you don't have a relationship with the Lord, if you've never asked him to be your Lord or your savior, the truth is you are alone. God has this plan and purpose for your life, but there's something that separates that and it's called sin. The Bible says that we've all fallen short of the glory of God. We've all sinned, we've all missed the mark. And the best news of all is that God didn't leave you there. He didn't leave you in that pit of sin. He sent his son Jesus to come, to take your place, to die on the cross. And when we just say, hey, I, I accept that, I believe that, and you confess your sin and you say, God, I'm a sinner and I need a savior. Thank you for saving me. Something amazing happens. God forgives you and he comes into that pit with you and he pulls you up. Psalm 40 says that we can wait patiently for the Lord and he will turn to you and hear your cry. In verse two, it says he lifted me out of the slimy pit and he will, he will lift you out of the mud and mire and he sets your feet on a rock and he gives you a firm place to stand. So if that's you, I wanna lead you in a prayer. You can repeat my words, you can cry out with your own, but just say, God, I'm a sinner and I need a savior. Thank you for sending Jesus for me. I, I ask you, Jesus, to come and take away all the junk, all the mistakes, all the flaws and failures that, I, that I've had. And thank you for saving me. God, I wanna live for you. I want to, to be new and I ask you, Jesus, to help me. God, and thank you for this gift of salvation, this gift of grace, I receive it now. In your name, amen.